It's been an uplifting uh, study because you are continually looking for God's hand. And as I've gone back through the pages of history here and there, it is, there's many times I, I, I jump up and I'm uh, reading a quote to my wife because you're, you're realizing uh, really how amazing the nation was as it started and what, and the place really that the Bible had as that nation was founded. But we're just as a, as a way of maybe just uh, going back to our previous class and a little refresher, everything to understand America, I believe, starts with understanding where Britain fits into Bible prophecy. And there's a number of these that we can go to, but Ezekiel 38 maybe is a, is a good spot to start because that gives us an interesting relationship that this Tarshish power has uh, with its, as it calls it, its young lions. So Ezekiel 38 and verse uh, 13, as it's mentioned there, it says, and this prophecy, just for um, context, is about the northern invader that's going to come down on Israel in the last days, in the final days. And there is going to be powers in the south that will stand up to this uh, confederacy of nations that we believe being uh, seen in Russia and Europe, although that's not tonight's class. But regardless, this power in the south, as it's said in verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So here's this power or these powers in the south that are going to speak against um, this, these, this northern confederacy. The English Bible, the New English Bible, translates that, the traitors of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. And that's the basis for the relationship that this Tarshish power has with its young lions, as it says. So traditionally, Christadelphians have looked at this and said, this is Britain and her commonwealth. And for the most part, that fits and that's okay. But unfortunately with America, there are some people now that are questioning that and wondering whether America has a part in these young lions as America is no longer, quote unquote, part of the commonwealth. And so we'll answer that. But just answering Britain, these are a number of points that when put together, if you, if you could say a shopping list, is pointing really only to one place, and that is uh, Britain. But from Isaiah 60 verse 9, this is also incredibly important for tonight, it is a maritime power in the latter days that assists the Jews in returning to their land. So maybe it's worth just turning that one up as well. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 9, surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So people have looked for a maritime power that would assist in returning the Jews back to their land. And so based on this verse and a few others, it was... John Thomas, and we'll, and we'll look at it a little later, that saw in Britain, uh, or foresaw, I should say, writing in the 1800s, uh, 1848, foresaw the role that Britain would play in bringing the Jew back to the land. And we can say today, correctly saw. And so when you go through the shopping list of um, identifying facts or factors on this Tarshish power, that top one is really hard to get around because a lot of people want to say it's Spain, they want to say it's this or that. It has to be a power that was involved in assisting the Jews back to their land. It's got to be a power that would be a trading nation and would have some sort of an empire or as uh, some people have looked for, a commonwealth. Uh, far away from Israel, and there's the verses there, Isaiah 23, 6 and 7, Jonah 1 and 3. They would be sea traders again. Uh, hearkening back to the maritime power. You get that in Isaiah 23, and it's uh, full of it there. And last but not least, 
mining silver, iron, tin, and lead. And those come in the two verses there, Ezekiel 27 and 12, Jeremiah 10 and 9. So when you put even just those pieces together, it's going to keep bringing you back to Britain. But tonight we're looking at America. And America was part of the original uh, commonwealth of, uh, of Great Britain. And this, this um, verse that we've referred to in Ezekiel 38 and 13, the traitors of Tarshish with all the young lions. The interesting fact is that it's actually America that is the uh, first real colony outside of the uh, British Isles. And this is a painting done of the first colonists coming in to uh, start the colony or the, the uh, settlement of Jamestown. And that was back in 16, or 1610, 12, around there, I believe. Actually, it says on the sign there, 1607. Nearby to the east is Jamestown, and this is the sign actually, uh, that's a picture of the sign uh, today in Jamestown. Nearby to the east is Jamestown, the original site of the first permanent English colony in North America. On 1407, uh, sorry, the 14th of May, 1607, a group of just over 100 men and boys recruited by the Virginia Company of London came ashore and established a settlement at Jamestown Island. So this is the first colony of, um, of Britain. And it's, this is from the archaeologist William Kelso. Jamestown is where the British Empire began. This was the first colony in the British Empire, he says. And that's really important because when so many people want to say that America is not part of this trading group of nations, I think the important thing to say is it doesn't say in the text that it has to be uh, at the latter days still part of the Commonwealth, but it had to be a trading partner. And certainly she was... Uh, part of the Commonwealth. In fact, she was the eldest of the young lions. This is a map of the um, was done for the uh, Queen back in the 1600s, the British Empire in America. And that was certainly the way it was uh, seen until, of course, you come to the independence. This is, in, this is um, a quote directly from the Commonwealth website, commonwealth.org, uh, to this point exactly. And it says, the roots of the Commonwealth go back to the British Empire when some countries were ruled directly or indirectly by Britain. Some of these countries became self-governing while retaining Britain's monarch as head of state. They formed the British Commonwealth of Nations. Today, however, membership is based on a free and equal voluntary cooperation. The last two countries to join the Commonwealth, Rwanda and uh, Mozambique, have no historical ties to the British Empire. So that's really important because today when you say, well, you know, Britain's not part of the Commonwealth, today the Commonwealth is still a group of trading nations, but you have countries in there that have no ties to Britain whatsoever and are still considered uh, part of the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth, or should we say, the trading group of uh, nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 have absolutely direct ties to Britain. In fact, they are, as it calls them, young lions, offspring out of this British empire that come. And so when it was first started, uh, Virginia was settled by the merchants of Virginia. It was said on that sign, the Jamestown sign about the, um, the, the uh, Virginia company, and that's who was uh, commissioned by the monarch in Britain at that time. And it was named Virginia after the uh, Virgin Queen Elizabeth, I believe. And at the bottom, this was their, uh, their um, emblem, and it's in uh, Latin, Ende Virginia Quintum, but it means uh, Virginia gives the fifth. And the point was that it was the fifth dominion of the crown. And so when you say England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, at that point, this was the first real colony of the uh, empire and the very beginnings of that empire, obviously. So Virginia the fifth. Now, interestingly, these are uh, going back to 1609, and they were uh, leaflets that were printed uh, for the British people. And interestingly on this one, 
they quote, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Now, I think that's really neat because even at that point, they're looking at the isles in Scripture and seeing that it has to do with Britain and seeing that it has to do with, now at this point, Virginia and the spread of the Word of God. Now, that's going to be key because as Britain goes out and builds her empire, so she takes with her the Bible. And uh, the other one was... uh, it's a an, an advertisement, and it was this is this is dirty advertising because it says offering most excellent fruits by planting in Virginia, um, exciting all such as be well affected to further the same. So it's encouraging people to go and join the settlement. The problem is when you get there. Oh, it's not all just good news. I mean, unfortunately, like the first winter in Jamestown, half of them die. It is uh, incredibly difficult uh, as they come to try and set up uh, these settlements. So it was certainly uh, advertising to say the least. But we spoke last time about in these are the White Cliffs of Dover. This verse, Jeremiah 31 and 10 Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. This is, I think, incredible, because, and this is, this is picking up a little bit on our class from last time, how the word of God was going to go forth to the nations, which meant one thing, and that was the Bible had to be translated. Because you weren't going to spread Hebrew, and you weren't going to spread Greek, to people that couldn't understand it. And so the Bible was translated into English, but it had a specific message to it. He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Now, Barbara Tushman in Bible and Sword um, gives us a picture of what it was like when the Bible was translated into English. She says, The people at last, given open access to the scriptures in their own tongue, were consumed with excitement and interest. They clustered around the huge folio volumes chained to every pulpit and listened avidly to whoever could read them aloud, as men today listen to the World Series results. In St. Paul's, where six Bibles had been fastened to diverse pillars, fixed unto the same with chains for all men to read them that would, the scenes of enthusiasm appalled the authorities." They'd opened something. They they didn't realize what it was going to do. King Henry VIII wanted to sever ties with the Roman Catholic Church, which was good and sounded good and really was good, but he didn't realize what it was going to do to the nation of Britain. And this was in God's plan, that the word would go forth. And so go forth it did. And so that was the trans, that would have been the, uh, the translation uh, and the Bible print was the great Bible at that point. And there is then comes the bishops and then the 1611 King James. But around the same time, you also get the Geneva Bible that's produced. And that was the Bible that actually the Puritans would have brought to America at the beginning. And At that point, once the Bible was translated into English and people could read it for themselves, boy, oh boy, did that upend society. No different than when the Lord Jesus Christ, he preaches the word and the world was turned upside down at his at his time. So, too, the world was turned upside down in Great Britain and that would spread as uh, time we would see spread to America. And so one of the earliest Um, Bible students was a man that looked for these things and wrote about them was Thomas Brightman and here he is speaking about the return of the Jews and he says shall they return to Jerusalem again there is nothing more certain the prophets do everywhere confirm it and beat upon it so that is 1615 so the Bible has I mean Tyndale was working in the mid 1500s so it doesn't take a lot of time by the time the Bible is freely available for people to read it and to start seeing these prophecies and making these conclusions. But in reading the Bible, 
they also wanted to not just separate the common man. The, well, here's the thing. King Henry VIII wants to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. But when the everyday man reads the Bible for themselves, they don't even want to have a part in the Anglican Church or the Church of England. And so many were persecuted. And so the Puritans flee to America. And that is in 1620. And so it doesn't take long, and these folks are uh, not being allowed to uh, read the scriptures for themselves. Certain ones are getting put in prison, and it was really quite a, uh, we would call it the Wild West, but it was, uh, wild, uh, it was a wild British Isles, as men and women started reading the scriptures for themselves. And there's a gentleman by the name of John Knox in Scotland, and... Uh, it, I mean, Scotland was a hotbed for, um, for the Reformation and for the, these, these beliefs because John Knox um, brought it to be that, well, through his teachings, they brought it to be that it was the school, schools were um, instituted, whatever you want to say, for most of society. It was one of the most literate societies there had been, I don't want to say ever because that would make it sound like I know going back to ever, but for thousands of years it would have been one of the most literate societies that came to be because they wanted men and women to be able to read the Bible for themselves, not just have it chained to a pulpit and read to them. But in America, Michael Pragai writes, there is no essay on the Puritan heritage in America that does not emphasize its deep roots in the Bible. To understand America, one has to first understand uh, pure, um, one has, what, to understand America, one has to first understand Puritanism, Puritanism, which in turn has its origins in the legends, Im uh, imagery, morals, legal codes, and prophecies of the Hebrew Bible. America's roots are embedded as it were, in the fertile soil of the Bible. And from there, they derive their life-sustaining vital fluids. Quite an incredible statement. And that book, Faith and Fulfillment, um, I, I was, I was re-getting into it and uh, looking through it, and in, incredible, incredible things that Michael Pragai writes about the, the, the Bible and the influence it had. And also, uh, he writes a fair bit about the Christadelphians and John Thomas. And he comments how excited John Thomas would be today to see these things unfolding. So that was, this is the basis of America. So it's no surprise then that it doesn't take them long. They've come away from uh, the church in, in England. They come and set up their colonies. And the Mayflower was, what did we say, 1620. By 1640, there is, this is the first printing in America. It's called the Bay of Psalms book. And the reason that they had it printed was because they wanted a Psalter, uh, Psalms. They wanted to be able to sing the Psalms, but closer to the original. <laughs> they wanted to, it retranslated and have it closer to the original. And that was the spirit of many on, uh, in America on this, side of, uh, on this side of the Atlantic. And so the Bay Psalms book was the first book printed in British North America. The book is a metrical Psalter, first printed in 1640 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The early residents of the Massachusetts Bay Colony brought with them several books of Psalms, but evidently they were dissatisfied with the translations from Hebrew in these several Psalters and wished for something that was closer to the original. Quite amazing. It shows the spirit of the age. And I don't know if we have time to go through it. But just like in Scotland, they wanted to have not just a few that were literate, but they wanted many that were literate. And so the schools that were uh, set up in the early days of the United States uh, and the school law here will, will, the school law will attest to it is actually quite amazing. Um, so this is, uh, the Mass this is the Massachusetts General School Law of 1647. It being, and it, write, and it reads, it being one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former times by keeping them in an unknown tongue. And that's interesting how he says, see how they wanted, see, and that was true of the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted to have the Bible kept in Latin. They didn't want it in English. Thus, William Tyndale is burnt at the stake. Because once men and women can read it for themselves, 
they could quickly uh, identify for to start the Roman Catholic Church itself, as we will as we will see, and so um, they keep it in an uh, unknown tongue. So in these latter times, by persuading them from the use of tongues so that at least the true sense and meaning of the original might be clouded and corrupted with love and false glosses of saint-seeming deceivers, and to the end that learning may not be buried in the grave of our forefathers in church and commonwealth, the Lord assisting our endeavors. It is, there, it is therefore ordered that every township in this juris, jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to 50,000 households, shall forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and to read, whose wages shall be paid either by the parents or masters of such children or by the inhabitants in general. And so it carries on. Uh, the, the bottom paragraph, and it is further ordered that when any town shall increase to the number of 100 families or households, they shall set up a grammar school, and the master thereof being able to instruct youth so far as they may be fitted for the, for the university, provided that if any town neglect the performance hereof above one year that every um, above one year that every such town shall pay five pounds to the next school till they shall perform this order. So it's law that the, the schools would be instituted for 50 towns above 50, towns above 100. And quite an effect this had. In fact, when Yale and Harvard, for sure, and I don't know about some of the other ones, uh, are started, early on it's begun that they, you have to learn Hebrew and Greek and in fact Latin as well because they wanted people to not only be able to read for themselves in English, but they wanted them to be able to go back to the original for themselves. So quite incredible. This is the, um, the New England Primer, and this was, I didn't put the date, I'm sorry, 1600s. Um, and this shows you, I mean, these people were coming out of a horrendous time, many of them in Europe and in Great Britain, and here is, this is for the children, but they want to make sure that the children themselves understand these things. Uh, and here it is, Mr. and there's a picture of John Rogers being burnt at the stake. It says, Mr. John Rogers, minister of the gospel in London, was the first martyr in Queen Mary's reign and was burnt at uh, Smitherfield, I can't write up too small on here, Smitherfield, I think it is, Smitherfield, February 14th, uh, 1554 his wife and nine small children and one of her and one of her breast following him to the stake and with which sorrowful sight he was not in the least um, and I can't read it on sorry mine's mine's uh, mine's small and that one's not great either let me see if I can I want to be able to read that because it's going to annoy me <laughs> with which sorrowful sight he was not in the least dissuaged, some di dis but with wonderful patience died courageously for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is something that they wanted to pass on. We don't have time to go into it now, but they were vehemently anti-Catholic because of the experiences that they had had in Europe, and as I say, even in Great Britain at the time of, at uh, this point, Mary, who was nicknamed uh, Bloody Mary for the amount of um, blood she had shed. What, incredible time period, but it's in these time period, in this time period, and in this uh, atmosphere, where the Bible thrived. And you have those, like we mentioned, John Knox, and then as you come over to Britain, or sorry, Britain, as you come over to America, you have many, and we'll, uh, we'll mention a few other ones. It is, um, this is, and th this, I just wanted to put a few quotes up to just show us and give us an idea of what it was like at the time um, as America is founded and as it goes forward, you get a, a feeling for the, the sentiments of some of these ones, and I actually took a few out because I knew I'd be struggling with time. But here's George Washington, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible, he says. And there was actually some at the beginning that didn't want a president. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to have God as their president. So quite an amazing, uh, amazing time. But 
This is George Washington saying this, the first president, and I never really understood entirely, I don't think, why they were, you know, if this is the way they felt, why did they want separation of church and state? But once I started getting into the history and realizing where they were coming from with the Roman Catholic Church governing the people, right, you, th you think of the way it was, and even the Anglican Church, the Church of England, not only were they uh, in the government, but they ruled, right? You, I mean, today you still have the Queen as the head, as the head of the Church of England. And they realized, uh, well, they realized, they experienced what that meant at that time when you have ungodly rulers. And so when it came to America and it was their turn to set up a country, they certainly wanted uh, none of those experiences. And this is a gentleman, uh, William Penn. He is the man from the Quaker Oat Box, which I found out. So now when you read Quaker o or eat your Quaker Oats, you can think of uh, William Penn. And he says, I do declare to the whole world that we believe the scriptures to contain a declaration of the mind and will of God and, in, um, and to those ages in which they were written, being given forth by the Holy Spirit, moving in the hearts of holy men of God, that they ought also to be read, believed, and fulfilled in our day, being used for reproof and instruction that the men of God may be perfect. They are a declaration and testimony of heavenly things themselves, and as such, we carry a high respect for them. We accept them as the words of God himself. And so with the Bible elevated to this level in society, what a society it was. And um, we don't have time for uh, John Quincy Adams. We could quote from him extensively. But this is actually 1669, and this comes directly into what we're speaking about tonight. Look at this is Increase Mather. I think it's a nice name, Increase. So any new babies that anyone's thinking of? Increase is a good name. Increase. Increase Mather. Uh, the mystery of Israel's salvation explained and applied or a discourse concerning the general conversion of the Israelitish nation, wherein is showed, number one, that the twelve tribes shall be saved. And so he carries on. And he quotes down here, I don't know if you can see it, he quotes Jeremiah 31, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. 1669, here we are on, the, on, in, on coastlands, as you can uh, translate that word, isles or coastlands, far off, and here it is, God said that his word would go forth and that it would carry a message. And here's that message being um, spoken about, and that is, he's a teacher, it says, in Boston, New England. So this is, the ex this is direct fulfillment. When I found this, I was ecstatic. So please soak it in and appreciate what I found because I was genuinely excited for this. Because this is, er this is 1600s and here they are understanding the message that God wanted them, them to, to read and to see from his scriptures. And we have uh, Abraham Lincoln, and this is what he said, of the Jews, restoring the Jews to their homeland is a noble dream shared by many Americans. He, the Jewish um, chiropodist of the president, so chiropodist is a foot doctor, right? Um, of the president has so many times put me on my feet that I would have no objection in giving his countrymen a leg up, he said, sort of in, in uh, humor. But that was the way uh, Lincoln felt as far as the Jewish people. Now, what else is in, I found amazing is when you get into this, I, I started thinking, you know, this is where, when we talk about America, this is where the truth as we know it, as Christadelphians, as we know it, this is where it came to light. This is where John Thomas really discovered the truth was on these new shores. And this uh, is a quote which I, th I think uh, sort of touches on that. The doctor, this is sort of, it's been, it's the, this has been going through uh, his shipwreck. This is from the book, The Life of John Thomas. It goes through his, uh, the shipwreck that he experienced and then how he comes to, the, to America. He finally uh, and searches, uh, goes to search for truth um, because of his experiences on that, on the ship going down. As, as we all know, he looked for, um, he wanted to find the, the truth of the scripture. The doctor, it says, did not forget his resolution to seek for the truth. He visited a Presbyterian church in New York, but decided it was no use hearing them anymore. 
Having letters of introduction to both a Baptist preacher and a professor of surgery from his father's associates in New York, they set off on a tedious journey to Cincinnati. He had been told that the Western people were very much infected with Reformation. And it's really neat, actually, when you go back to those times, and I uh, got an old book on the history, um, the religious history in America or something, and what a, and in the 1800s, what a time it was. And they called it frontier religion. And frontier religion was, I mean, when he says Cincinnati, that is, that was at that time the West, right? I mean, it hadn't all opened up yet. That truly was the West for them. And so he goes out to the West and there was, and in the, and I didn't put a quote, maybe I should have, but it's, it talks about how at this point, when you go out to the West, there are no big Gothic churches. There are no uh, big congregations and the Anglicans didn't, or the Church of England didn't have a foothold the same as they did. In Virginia, the Anglicans or the Church of England, that was really their, their place. But, and New England, as you can see further to the North, was much more Puritan. But at this point, here's John Thomas that goes to search for truth and goes to the area that is very much infected with Reformation. And I think it's really neat that when I went through this history, I thought, wow, and this is where God gives or, you know, assists, whatever you want to say, helps John Thomas in some way find the truth. And it's there and in, in here or when he writes Elpis Israel, and we know the quote, uh, I know not whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Britain, whether they entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and promoting its colonization by the Jews. Their present intentions, however, are of no importance one way or the other because they will be compelled by events soon to happen to do what under existing circumstances heaven and earth combined could not move them to attempt. And so it carries on. And he talks about the partial and primary restoration of the Jews. And it's on these passages that Michael Pragai is, uh, is writing in his book, Faith and Fulfillment, when he talks about how excited uh, John Thomas would be uh, today. So when we talk about uh, America and its place as far as um, helping the Jews return to their land, as far as the restoration of Israel is concerned. And that verse, as we refer to it time and again, Jeremiah 31, hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it on isles afar off. He that scattered Israel will gather him. The incredible thing is the amount at which I discovered America actually had to do with the regathering of the Jewish people. So although primarily we would have said that it was Britain, and Britain did, I mean, Britain was the first, and uh, Brother Paul in his recent article of the Bible magazine speaks of how when we, we look at the ships of Tarshish bringing this, um, God's sons from far, it says the ships of Tarshish first. Incredibly, you would, you would say, well, yes, the Balfour Declaration, it was definitely headed up by those in Britain, Although even the Balfour Declaration was approved by Woodrow Wilson, the president at that time of the United States. And uh, this quote from um, Jill Hamilton speaks to this. And she says, uh, which is a book called God, Guns, and Israel. And she writes, it is unlikely that the Jews would have been able to establish themselves in Palestine in the three decades after 1918, had it not been for the enthusiasm of the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and the members of his government. Nor would they have established their official footing there without equal support from President Woodrow Wilson and the government of the United States of America. With all the determination in the world, the Jews would not have been in a position to expand their hold. Quite simply, Israel might never have existed. The incredible thing is, is that it's the reading of scripture that motivates so many in Britain and in America to help the Jews. It's going to be, if you go through, it's a reoccurring theme with with individuals uh, that you know are not in government but still have to do with and those in the highest levels of government they've been raised on the Bible and many of the uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, Truman he's somebody that was raised on the scripture from an early age and when it when it came to their um, actions as far as Israel was concerned it was almost obvious to them that they would assist in uh, helping out uh, the Jewish people in regaining their homeland. But 
Well, we'll, we'll end with that. So we'll leave that, leave that there for a minute, that thought. But going forward, then we can see America is involved. They're not, they're, I mean, Britain is taking up the lead. But if you know history, it doesn't take long after the Balfour Declaration and the time in between the First World War and the Second World War where you get uh, changes in the government in Britain. And Britain, unfortunately, goes through what I would consider one of its lowest times. And it turns against the Jews uh, incredibly so, actually, almost right against what they said they would uh, do with the Balfour Declaration. And they actually work to limit the number of Jews that can go back. And it's not our story tonight, but it's a very sad time. But the funny thing is that Britain the young lions were not affected so. So in time, you see America picks up almost where Britain left off. And it was interesting when you come to uh, Canada over the last however many years, we had Stephen Harper. And that was during the presidency of Barack Obama. So where when America actually wasn't, uh, was actually working against the Jewish people in many ways, um, there was still, seems to be, you know, there's still a provision from this family of nations to support, uh, to support Israel. So it's, it's there in, in different levels, but certainly in America, it looks like we may be uh, turning back to uh, some of the ways that they were. But it, you can't also help um, notice that it was, or, or point out, shall we say, that it was America's entrance into World War II that was the uh, conclusive deciding factor in bringing uh, it, the World War II, to an end. Which, of course, when we think of uh, the Young Lions and the protection of the Jewish people, this is certainly uh, has uh, uh, a lot to, to do, I think, with America really stepping up for the Jews. That obviously wasn't their, you know, they were protecting their own interests, uh, but in, in doing that, they also helped the, the Jewish people. Once uh, Germany fell under, pres the pres uh, under the presidency of Truman, Dwight Eisenhower would declare the entire American zone of Germany a temporary haven for the Jewish refugees. Not only that, but Truman would help, uh, or sorry, would keep the borders of Germany and Austria open to fleeing refugees. So at this point, when it starts coming to the breakup of Germany and the end of World War II, the America is incredibly uh, helpful to the Jewish people, and maybe in some ways because of what they witnessed. This is the inmates uh, waving a homemade American flag as they greet the U.S. 7th Army troops upon their arrival in the Allach uh, concentration camp. And it was the Americans that went in and liber liberated many of those camps. And I think that it may have had a, a really deep effect on, the, uh, on America at that point. Certainly the administration of Truman uh, and obviously Eisenhower himself. And as he's, uh, I, don't, I didn't put a picture up, he, is, he goes personally into some of the camps uh, to see what went on. And he actually, it's amazing, we just don't have time for everything. Eisenhower actually works with some of the Jewish underground because Britain has put a... Um, a blockade on any Jews going back to Palestine and they're stopping it. And America actually, and it was, it was my, it was my mother that pointed, gave me the quote actually, but I'm, we're not using it right now, but America with Eisenhower actually start sending some of their own boats full of Jewish refugees back to, uh, back to Israel. And Britain is hopping mad but it's super awkward because America is their ally, and here they are sending in American uh, American boats. In fact, in one of the cases, they actually use a British ship to send the Jews back. So it's 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 kind of fun history when you get into it and you realize what was going on. But I think this had a profound effect, and in fact, that flag is uh, is still kept in the Simon Wies Wiesenthal. Um, archives, I believe, or at least the, the picture of it I got from the Simon Wiesenthal archives, but it's still there and kept. Um, and there it doesn't look like it's weathered so uh, too well, but it shows you the reality of this, these situations and of, of, of the time. And so the state of Israel was born. We've mentioned um, in fulfillment to the prophecies, we've mentioned the work of Truman and it was later on when Truman would actually look back on what had happened and what was done. 
And the next, uh, this quote I think is quite interesting. Harry Truman visited the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York and was introduced as the man who helped create the state of Israel. And just so you know what he did, well, I, get, I have a quote actually of it afterwards, so I'll mention it. Uh, Truman replied, though, he said, what do you mean helped create? I was Cyrus. I am Cyrus. Like, you realize the level to, you think, oh, I wonder if he was thinking about it. No, 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 no. He was absolutely thinking about what he was doing. There was no doubt in Truman's mind what he was uh, trying to accomplish and what he did accomplish. So, in Incredible uh, as you go through um, some of these uh, these men, and we don't, maybe won't read all of this, but at 11 minutes after the expiration of the British mandate, Truman made his declaration in Washington soon afterwards. And there was many that were trying to stop the state of Israel actually being proclaimed and were looking for ways to, you know, get around it. But Truman made his declaration in Washington soon afterwards in the hall of the United Nations, the American representative who had been urging the forming of a trusteeship quietened the room. A message on ticker tape had just been received from Truman. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government himself or itself. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. With those words, legitimacy was granted to the new state of Israel under international law. Ezekiel's prophecy was fulfilled, writes Jill Hamilton. The wandering Jew had a home to return to. Israel's land and people were again united. Arab armies would now be fighting against a recognized state and Truman's rapid action and recognition of the state and its provisional government nullify the proposal to place Palestine under a temporary United, United Nations trusteeship. So there was, they were trying to do other things than proclaim a state of Israel. And I, I don't know if it's it, uh, 11 minutes. So 11 minutes after Israel had declared the state, Truman was in there and shut the doors to any, anything else happening. Once the United States accepted Israel as the state, Israel became the state. And so over and over again, as I'm going through looking, you know, as America, you know, is it one of the young lions? Goodness gracious. I mean, America is almost leading in bringing the Jews back to the land and in helping the state be proclaimed. And as we're going to see, uh, there's uh, does even more than just that. So when we look at Tarshish and the, uh, and the characteristics, shall we say, of that nation, and then look for where, does, where does, uh, you know, does America still fit in with these young lion nations, America was the first young lion to maybe, shall we say, leave the, uh, le I don't know, you wouldn't say leave the nest, what the lions have, leave the pride, was maybe the first to leave the pride uh, and was the eldest, but certainly uh, has not lost the characteristics, and as, as they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And that has been the story of, um, the story of America. And in fact, there's another quote saying, in some ways, the U.S. Has, has preserved 18th century Britain rather better than Britain herself. They have preserved more of the validity and independent spirit of the Protestant and Puritan religion than we have succeeded in doing in apathetic Britain. And that's MP John Redwood as he uh, writes in his book, Stars and Strife. So incredibly, you know, Amer uh, Britain today is, is so much more a atheistic. And uh, I mean, Britain has turned its back on the Bible so much more than America. In Canada, we're maybe a little bit more like Britain, but in America, and I've been going down there for work now, uh, for now a number of years, and the level to which the Bible is still, I was in a hotel and uh, just the other, uh, a month ago, and I came out of the elevator and there was like, not small, not like a little, the huge seal of, I don't know if it's the seal of Ohio, but it was this massive uh, seal on the wall uh, speaking about, uh, it wasn't in God we trust, but it was another, it was one of those uh, sort of sayings, but it was actually even more, I should have taken a picture of it. And I sat there, and the Bible still and God is still, is stubbornly staying around in America and has still a huge influence. But let's just go through a couple of these things. We're not going to go into them deeply, just mention them. Look at this. Uh, when I discovered this, this is another of those almost hallelujah moments. Operation Magic Carpet or an Eagle's Wings, the rescue of Jews from Yemen. You can go on to Amer Alaskan Airlines website, just uh, their 
their website, and it's all listed in the, in the About Us or the History section. Tons of it. It's all there, the history of these pilots that um, went from Alaska, from the Alaskan Airlines, and the planes went as well, and to rescue the Jews from Yemen. And they brought tens of thousands of them home at a time when the Arabs were hotly against it. And these pilots, these uh, commercial pilots, were having to uh, evade Arab gunfire and fly low through some of the sections of the desert. It was, it's, it's an incredible story. But I'm sitting there going, you know, here's God saying that his sons are going to come from far. And who's the nation that's helping them? There's the big Alaskan Airlines. And it doesn't stop there because it carries on. Where, and when you come to Operation Ezra and Nehemiah and the rescue of the Jews from Iraq, I'm reading through, and there's another, oh, goodness gracious, here they are again. And, and uh, they say, you know, when they wanted to rescue the Jews quickly from Iraq, the doors were closing quick. It was, it was getting to be quite a nasty situation. They called on Alaskan Airlines. And Alaskan Airlines was also the airline that helped bring the Jews from uh, Thailand as well. So you, it, it kept coming up. And in part, I think it was because Alaskan Airlines, you know, there's always a, a commercial aspect to it. They were making money and winning the contracts. And for them, there was a lot of uh, slow time, shall we say, and getting all these extra, uh, running all these extra flights was actually commercially a good, a good thing. But the pilots speak about how it changed them and what an experience it was. But Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, and, there the, and there's the Jews uh, coming uh, from Iraq. Now, and we could go through that, and it comes up time and time again, even when it's, uh, Israel's on its own feet, and you've got the Jews uh, helping themselves to come back. The ones still diplomatically helping out, it's still the American administration's helping to, it was the case with the Ethiopian airlift. Uh, whoever the president was at that point, he's the one pulling the strings behind uh, to keep the doors open and make it happen. So... There's another one, and this is called Operation Nickel Grass, and this one is, is fantastic. It's the, we all know of and speak about the war of uh, 1967, the Six Day War, but within a few years later, in 1973, Israel would fight another war, and it would be a life or death, death situation, and she would be on her knees, as the Arabs that time were the ones to pounce first, and it was on their holiest day, and through synagogues throughout Israel, they were st standing up at the front like I am here, except reading out names of all the young Jewish men that were being called up on the holiest day. And there's the story of the one, I believe, rabbi who has to stand up and read out his own son's name. And so many of these young Jews had to go out to war, and they were taken by surprise, and many were killed, and they were running out of weapons, they were running out of armaments, and they were in a chokehold, and, and it was literally almost like they were done. And, they, and the U.S., long story short, they basically said, take everything we've got and put it in the air. I can't remember, was it Nixon at the time? Um, and they, I think it's President Nixon, and he says, we're basically, we're going to get in trouble for helping, the, helping out the Jews regardless, one way or the other. He said, so if we help them a little bit or we help them a lot, we're going we're gonna to we're gonna hear from it. So they just gave them everything. And they just started the transport planes flying. And it was um, Prime Minister Golda Meir at the time when she heard that the airlift had started. And she was in, in the cabinet meeting. Um, in a cabinet meeting, she uh, started to cry when she heard that help was coming. And that was the level to where the nation was. And I think it's good for us to hear these things and go through some of these things and then step back. And when you, for me, once, the more I went through it and then said, you know, is America part of the young lions? Uh, you know, I mean, it just, it almost becomes laughable to think of her as anything else. And it carries on to even to today. This is um, the U.S. ensuring Israel's air superiority. And it's the new F-35 that's within the last month or two. Uh, a couple months that Israel's just received the F-35. Uh, and the U.S., even under Barack Obama, is still allowing Israel to have the upper hand on some of these things. So that's one side of it. But before we, before we come to a close and say, okay, well, there it is, there's another level to this which is quite incredible. And this is 
We've seen it from the beginning. You see it in increased Mather as he says that, you know, the Jews are going to go back. The 12 tribes are going to be saved. And it's written about in the 1600s. That force in America of those that have read the prophecies and have um, looked for it, or in many cases, you could even say Truman was in many ways a religious Zionist, um, some would argue, many have helped fulfill. Even to today, the force of religious Zionism in the U.S. is huge. And there's, you can look on it on the, on the big level, but you know, even as individuals, so many of those of, of people in around the world, but honestly, specifically in America, so much of it comes, uh, comes about, have read the prophecies and have done their part in helping the fulfillment. This is a website called Heyovel, Heyovel, Heyovel.com. Now this one was, uh, Brother Tim gave this to me because uh, when Brother Tim went over with uh, Brother James Diliberto, they spent some time together in Israel. They went to work on a vineyard on Mount Gerizim. And there was a, a gentleman there by the name of Nir, I think his last name is Levi. And Nir was just, it was in his first year, or second year, first, Tim was there for the first wine coming, uh, being ready. And so he was very early on in the vineyard. And he had decided by reading the prophecy. So now we're looking at a Jew in Israel reading the prophecies and being motivated, saying, you know what, I can do that. And so off he went to go and uh, start a vineyard to fulfill, to fulfill the prophecies. At the same time, when Tim's there, there's a Christian family. And um, what was their, what's their last name? The Wallars. The Wallars are there, and Tim and James meet the Wallars. The Wallars have read God's word and are motivated by the prophecies. And so they decide they're going to go over and help. They have 11 children, and they learned farming from working with uh, some Amish. And they decide they, from reading that uh, the promises to Abraham, I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee, they decided that they wanted to go and help bless Israel if they could. So the whole family with their 11 kids went over, and this was when Tim was uh, first there years ago, and I believe uh, my mom and dad have met them since. They all went over and helped near uh, in his vineyard. So they'd all, they were all there pruning the vineyard. They've now grown and have built up their uh, work. And they have hundreds of volunteers that go over now of Christians, uh, primarily in America, but Christians coming over to help the Jews um, farm in the, in the West Bank and on the mountains of Israel. And uh, Nir at the time wasn't, sh wasn't very sure, but he said, you know, he looked at it and, and said how the, um, the Gentiles will be their vine dressers, uh, that, that prophecy. And he thought, you know, maybe it's the hand of God. And so he decided he would take the help. And since then, he has now, like his vineyard is up and running and it's, and it's full on. You can go to his, uh, his website. It's like Braca Wines or something, but we, I mean, we can find that. But he, he um, now has, I think Tim said, I was just talking to Tim about it, and he said he has only still five employees, but hundreds of volunteers that come over and help from, these, uh, from, this, from this, uh, this group now, Hey Ovel. But when you look at it, you think it's, to me, it's just, it's 100% the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 is, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, declared in the isles afar off. He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. The word of God that was given to the Jews, they in turn give to the Gentiles. The Gentiles read it and in turn help the Jews. It's quite an incredible thing and, we, and we'll uh, maybe uh, close off with that. But this, this family the, um, that has started this, uh, there he is, Tommy Waller, and I critically actually printed this out to read you some, but I see we're well out of time, so good thing I didn't. But he just, this is just a few, uh, few days ago, he wrote this because of the resolution 2334 that Obama let go through the UN that condemned the settlements. He looks at it, and this is what he says, News of a resolution delegitimizing the Jewish communities of East Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria stalked 
shocked, sorry, shocked and surprised both those who stand with and those who stand against Israel last Thursday. We felt some relief when we got word of its indefinite postponement the same day, Friday. However, proved uh, the indefinite time was only 24 hours later. What I saw played out by the 15-member UN Security Council deeply grieved me. Personally, he says, the most discouraging thing was witnessing the obvious indifference to the Christian community, or by the Christian community, like they weren't so bothered about it. And here he is on the mountains of Israel, and he points out that by you know, the, the, this resolution going through, it makes the communities of Judea and Samaria illegal by international law, and in turn makes all his work and everything that he does illegal. So he's saying he doesn't know where it's going to go. But here is these, and I think, I don't even think it's hundreds, I think it's thousands now of Christians that go over and help. And many of the, of the Jews actually see it in a way that, and you, you know, like in the end, we'll see the way in which God has worked entirely. But it's incredible that here they are, uh, all these Gentiles going over to help um, the Jews bring the land back. So that's, and it's this, it's this help, and we could go through so many different ones over the time that have made a huge difference, and this is just uh, one of those stories. The other one you'd go to, it'd be um, in Britain. They had the guy uh, that helped start the, um, well, really start the Israel army, and he was just one guy that's over there. What's his name again? Uh, or Wingate. It's one, it's one guy that has read the prophecies and is doing everything he can to help. But it's again, it's the effect of God's word going out. And of course, this is going on to Tim's class the other week. Uh, the, the difference that's going to, uh, that this is going to make having a new president in. And the words of Mike Pence saying about Israel's fight is our fight. Israel's cause is our cause. Israel is not just our strongest ally in the Middle East. It is our most cherished ally in the world. Let the word go forth from, forth from Donald Trump and uh, that Donald Trump and I are proud to stand with Israel, he says. So as crazy as Donald Trump and his tweets might be, what an incredible time we may be seeing this year. So, you know, God works in incredible ways to bring about his, his promises and his prophecies. But the important thing is with all of this is to see, I suppose, God's hand in all of it. But this is Barbara Tushman. This is where we'll close. It's a curious irony that the Jews retrieved their home partly through the operation of the religion they gave to the Gentiles. And Isaiah 55 verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And so, as we've seen God's hand... Uh, go out and work with the nations and put into power those that he will. It's incredible when you go over the history of the United States, specifically for tonight, and the help that they have given and the assistance that they have given to God's people in restoring them. So we, we called the class America the Young Lion because I was so convinced by the end that there was no, there was no, uh, there was no doubting America's place. And so... Uh, I appreciate your time, and we'll leave it there. Thanks.